let's lay it out some foundations. I think one useful one comes from the paper, technological approach to mind everywhere. Mm -hmm. An experimentally grounded framework for understanding diverse bodies and minds. Could you tell me about this framework? And maybe can you tell me about figure one from this paper that has a few components? One is the tiers of biological cognition that goes from group to whole organism to whole tissue organ, down to neural network, down to cytoskeleton, down to genetic network. And then there's layers of biological systems from ecosystem down to swarm, down to organism, tissue, and then finally cell. So can you explain this figure and can you explain the TAME so-called framework? So this is the version 1.0 and there's a, there's a kind of update at 2.0 that I'm writing at the moment, trying to uh, formalize in a careful way all the things that we've been talking about here. And in particular, this notion of having to do experiments to figure out where any given system is on a continuum. And we can, let's, let's just start with figure two maybe for a second and then we'll come back to figure one. And first, just to unpack the acronym, I like the idea that it spells out TAME because the central focus of this is interactions and how do you um, how do you interact with a system to have a productive interaction with it. And the idea is that cognitive claims are really protocol claims. When you tell me that something has some degree of intelligence, what you're really saying is this is the set of tools I'm going to deploy and we can all find out how that worked out for you. And so um, technological, because I wanted to be clear uh, with my colleagues that this was not a, pro a project in just philosophy. This had very specific empirical uh, implications that are going to play out in engineering and regenerative medicine and so on. Technological approach to mind everywhere, this idea that we don't know yet where different kinds of minds are to be found, and we have to uh, empirically figure that out. And so what you see here in figure two is basically this, this idea that there is a spectrum, and I'm just showing four waypoints along that spectrum. And as you move to the right of that spectrum, a couple of things happen. Persuadability goes up, meaning that the systems become more reprogrammable, more plastic, more able to do different things than whatever they're standardly doing. So you have more ability to get them to do new and interesting things. The effort needed to exert influence goes down. That is, autonomy goes up, and to the extent that you are good at convincing or motivating the system to do things, you don't have to sweat the details as much, right? And this also has to do with what I call engineering agential materials. So when you engineer um, wood, metal, plastic, things like that, you are responsible for absolutely everything because the material is not going to do anything other than hopefully hold its shape. If you're engineering... Uh, active matter or your engineering computational materials or better yet, um, agential materials like like living, living matter, you can do some very high level uh, prompting and let the system then do very complicated things that you don't need to micromanage. And we all, we all know that that uh, increases when you're starting to work with intelligent systems like animals and, and humans and so on. And the other thing that goes down as you get to the right is the amount of mechanism or physics that you need to exert the influence goes down. So if you know how your thermostat is to be set as far as its set point, you really don't need to know much of anything else, right? You, you just need to know that it is a homeostatic system and that this is how I change the set point. You don't need to know how the cooling and heating plant works in order to get it to do complex things. By the way, a quick uh, pause just for people who are listening. Let me describe what's in the figure. So there's four different systems going up the scale of persuadability. So the first system is a mechanical clock, then it's a thermostat, then it's a, a dog that gets rewards and punishments, Pavlov's dog, and then finally, a bunch of very smart looking humans communicating with each other and arguing, persuading each other using hashtag reasons. And then uh, there's arrows below that showing persuadability going up as you go up these systems from the mechanical clock to a bunch of Greeks arguing and then going down as the effort needed to exert influence, and once again going down as mechanism knowledge needed to exert that influence. Yeah, I'll give you an example about that panel C here with the with the dog. Isn't it amazing that humans have been training dogs and horses for thousands of years, knowing zero neuroscience? Also amazing is that when I'm talking to you right now, I don't need to worry about manipulating all of the synaptic proteins in your brain to make you understand what I'm saying and hopefully remember it. You're going to do that all on your own. I'm giving you very thin, in terms of information uh, content, very thin prompts, and I'm counting on you as a, as a multi-scale agential material to take care of the chemistry underneath. 
Right? So you don't need a wrench to convince me. Correct. I don't need, and I don't need physics to convince you. And I don't need to know how you work. Like I, I don't need to understand all of the steps. What I do need to have is trust that you are a multi-scale cognitive system that already does that for, for yourself. And you do like, this is an amazing thing. I don't, people don't think about this enough. I think, uh, when you wake up in the morning and you have social goals, research goals, financial goals, whatever, whatever it is that you have in order for you to act on those goals, Sodium and calcium and other ions have to cross your muscle membranes. Those incredibly abstract goal states ultimately have to make the chemistry dance in a very particular way, right? The, the, your, your, our entire body is, is, is a transducer of, of very abstract things. And, and by the way, not just our, our brains, but other, you know, our organs have... Um, uh, uh, anatomical goals and other things that we can talk about because all of this uh, plays out in, uh, in, in, in regeneration and development and so on. But that the scaling, right, of all of these things, the way, that, the way you regulate yourself is not by, oh my God, you don't have to sit there and think, wow, I really have to push some, some, you know, some sodiums across this membrane. All of that happens automatically. And that's the, that's the incredible benefit of these multi-scale materials. So what I was trying to do in this paper is a couple of things. All of these were, by the way, drawn by Jeremy Gay, who's this amazing uh, graphic artist that uh, works with me. First of all, in panel A, which is the spiral I was trying to point out, is that at every level of biological organization, like we all know we're sort of nested dolls of, uh, you know, organs and tissues and cells and molecules and whatever. But what I was trying to point out is that this is not just structural. Every one of those layers is competent and is doing problem solving in different spaces and spaces that are very hard for us to imagine. We humans are, because of our own evolutionary history, we are so obsessed with movement in three-dimensional space that even, even in AI, you see this all the time. They say, well, this thing doesn't have a robotic body. It's not embodied. Yeah, it's not embodied by moving around in 3D space, but biology has embodiments in all kinds of spaces that are hard for us to imagine, right? So your cells and tissues are moving in high dimensional physiological state spaces and in, in, uh, trans um, gene expression state spaces, in anatomical state spaces. They're doing that perception, decision-making, action loop that we do in 3D space when we think about robots wandering around your kitchen they're doing those loops in these other spaces. And so the first thing I was trying to point out is that, yeah, every layer of your body has its own ability to solve problems in those spaces. And then um, on the right, what I was saying is that this distinction between, you know, people say, well, there are living beings and then there are engineered machines. And then they often follow up with all the things machines are never going to be able to do and whatever. And so what I was trying to point out here is that it is very difficult to maintain those kind of distinctions because life is incredibly interoperable. Uh, life doesn't really care if, if um, the thing it's working with was evolved through random trial and error or was engineered with a higher degree of, of agency because at every level within the cell, within the tissue, within the organism, within the collective, you, you can replace and substitute engineered systems with the naturally evolved systems. And that question of, is it really, you know, is it biology or is it technology? I don't think is a useful question anymore. So I was trying to warm people up with this idea that what we're going to do now is talk about minds in general, regardless of their history or their composition. It doesn't matter what you're made of. It doesn't matter how you got here. Let's talk about what you're able to do and what your inner world looks like. That was the, the goal of that. Uh, is it useful to, as a thought experiment, as an experiment of radical empathy to try to put ourselves in the space of the different uh, minds at each stage of the spiral. It's like what state space is human and civilization as a collective embodied? Mm. Like what does it operate in? So humans, individual organisms operate in 3D space. That's what we understand. But when there's a bunch of us together, mm. what are we doing together? It's really hard and you have to do experiments, which at larger scales is, are, you know, re really difficult. But there is such a thing. There may well be. We have to do experiments. I, I don't know. There's an example. Somebody will say to me, well, you know, with your, with your kind of panpsychist view, you, you might as, you, you probably think the weather is, uh, is, in, is agential too. It's like, well, I can't say that, but we, we don't know. But have you ever tried to see if a hurricane has habituation or sensitization? Maybe. We, we haven't done the experiment. It's hard, but you could, right? And maybe, maybe weather systems can have certain kinds of memories. I have no idea. We have to do experiments. So I don't know what the entire human society is doing, but, but I'll just give you a simple example of, um, 
uh, the kinds of tools. And we're, we're actively trying to build tools now to enable radically different agents to communicate. So, so we, we, we are doing this using, using AI and other, uh, other tools to try and, uh, try and get this kind of communication going across very different spaces. And I'll just give you a, a very kind of dumb example of, of, of how, how that might be. Imagine that, um, you're playing tic-tac-toe against an alien. So you're in a room, you don't see him. Uh, and so, so you, you, you draw the tic-tac-toe thing on the board, on the floor and, uh, and you know what you're doing. You're trying to, uh, you're trying to make straight lines with X's and O's and you're having a nice game. It's obvious that he understands the process. Like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, like it's obvious in that, in that one little, little segment of activity, you guys are sharing a world. What, what's happening in the other room next door? Well, let's say the alien doesn't know anything about geometry, doesn't understand straight lines. What he's doing is he's got a, he's got a box. And it's full of uh, basically billiard balls, each one of which has a number on it. And all he's looking, he's doing is he's looking through the box to find billiard balls whose numbers add up to 15. He doesn't understand geometry at all. All he understands is arithmetic. You don't think about arithmetic. You think geometry. The reason you guys are playing the same game is that there's this magic square right? Mm -hmm. That somebody could constructed that basically is, is a three by three square where if you pick the numbers, right, they add up to 15. He has no idea that there's a geometric interpretation to this. Mm -hmm. He is, he is solving the problem that, that, that he sees, which is, which is totally algebra. You don't know anything about that, but if there is an appropriate interface like this magic square, you guys can share that experience. You can have an experience. It, it doesn't mean you start to think like him. It means that you guys are able to interact in a particular way. Okay. So there's a mapping between the two different ways of seeing the world that allows you to communicate with of each seeing other. a thin slice of the world 